Hi everyone, my name is Yao Hill. I'm from the assessment office of University of Hawaii at Manoa. Today, my session is on rubrics for assessing student learning. And I have several session outcomes for you. I hope that by the end of this session, you'll be able to operate the mechanics of rubric construction, design strategies to develop rubrics that best assist learning, and present assessment results that informs teaching. And I do have a hidden agenda where I hope to change your mindset from using rubric for assessment to rubric for learning. So let me get started. First, uh, let me show you the definition of rubrics. According to the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary, rubrics is a guide listing specific criteria for grading or scoring academic papers, projects, or tests. So it's specific criteria for grading. In our office, assessment office at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, we have a much more descriptive definition. We define rubric as an assessment tool, often shaped like a matrix, which describes levels of achievement in a specific area of performance, understanding, or behavior. So it looks like something like this. So this is very generic. On the left-hand side, you can see that we have a different judgment criteria. Those represent features of performance or skills that are significant in making judgments about student learning. For example, we can have criteria like language accuracy, pragmatic usage, nonverbal language appropriateness, intercultural sensitivity or competency, so on and so forth. At the top, at the co column header, we can see the, these describe different performance levels from beginning to approaching expectation, meeting expectation, exceeding expectation, and so on. And these headers, you can change it to uh, your liking. I can give you a couple of more examples. For example, in this one, we have beginning, emerging, developing, proficient. Yet another one, beginning, developing, accomplished, exemplary. So you want to capture the upper end of performance, you can use this one. And this one's funny. You're fired, needs work, adequate, professional. So this is more like a judging professional uh, performance, right? Professionalism performance. And the thing is that all of the examples you see has four levels of performance, but that doesn't have to be, right? It can be three levels if you think three levels represent the level of the students in your class, developing competent exemplary, or even uh, fewer. When you start developing a rubric, you can just say what meets your expectations. That can be as helpful to students in terms of their learning, uh, you know, as, as, as have, you know, better than have nothing at all. So you can start here and slowly describe uh, this developing a rubric in a more fledged rubric like what I presented earlier. So let me just uh, give you a quick uh, demonstration of how to use this website, quick rubric. Many of you may have used it before, but I understand is a part of your homework that you have to use this, or, you know, this is an essential tool for you to develop a rubric. So I'm going to exit here. And I'm going to this uh, website called Quick Rubric. Uh, I think Stephen can type in the URL for you to, to, to look as well. So when you, when you come here, you do not have to create a account right away. You can simply click Create a Rubric. Here you can have a title. So for me, I would say Conduct Interview, for example. I say Descriptions is to judge the performance level or learning progress towards uh, learning progress related to competency, interacting with target language speaker. Language speaker, so on. Here, I can have different criteria on the left hand side, right? For example, I say a kind of open and exit interview politely. Uh, I would write politely, but I'm not just uh, for time's sake. Uh, second, I may say something like be able to ask, ask interview questions and clarifications politely. I am able to, I ask students to be able to use 
verbal techniques to engage the interviewee. For example, give them example, repeating key words, paraphrasing, summarizing, paraphrasing, so on. And here, I, ha I have another criteria, but where do I add it? I can just simply add a row here. I can say, I also want to see students be able to use non-verbal techniques to engage, blah, blah, blah. And for example, that would be nodding, showing acknowledgement, back channeling, and so on and so forth. Okay, and I will provide descriptors. What does it mean just proficient, emerging, or beginning? And now if, if you want to develop a, a four level rubric, you can simply add a column here. So you just add a column or get rid of a column, get rid of a column. Okay, there's no undo. You can just get rid of column right here. And then, but you probably have to rename all your headers, beginning, and emerging, developing, and so on, right? You provide different uh, descriptions. And you can save the rubric. When it saves the rubric, you can click on a new user. It forces you to create a new account. I already have the account, so I can just log in. I think this is my login username. And this is my password, save successful. Okay, and after you save successful, you can view or print. It looks like this, you can print your rubric and the printing view should show up. So you can print it out or you can save it on your computer. Okay, so this is how we operate the mechanics of developing a rubric, just where to put what. Now I'm going back to my presentation, which I think is uh, what I want to emphasize today. So hopefully, um, we the thing with rubric is that we want to develop the rubric for the ultimate purpose of assessing learning. So if we can develop a rubric that helps students to learn better, that would be a much better rubric for assessing learning as well. Let me give you a quiz. I'm going to give you three examples and you can take a look to see whether they are capable of assisting learning or not. First example, in this rubric, we have two criteria: language accuracy and different levels, poor, fair, good, excellent, and so on and so forth. And look at the descriptor. Students demonstrate excellent accuracy in language use, good, fair, poor, I mean, why do we even bother provide these descriptors if they're just repeating the key words of the performance level, right? So these kind of descriptors, we call them empty descriptors because students would have no idea what excellent, good, fair, or poor entails. So we do not like them. We do not think that these kind of descriptors are assisting learning. Next, this one's relatively tricky. Look, I'm just using one criteria, language accuracy here. Look at the description. At proficient level, students make no or minimum number of mistakes that do not interfere with understanding. Look at, here we have a number. With this rubric, we can definitely reliably assess our students' performance because it's very objective here. So this is a very operationalizable rubric for assessment, no problem. We love this rubric. Uh, for assessment, um, we can, you know, we can reach through it. It's, it's very specific, and we can operationalize, no problem. But the thing is that if I'm a student, I'm looking at this rubric, I'm thinking, uh, you know, if I know how many number of mistakes that I'm making, maybe I wouldn't make them in the first place, right? So this kind of rubric not only, you know, renders students feel help, helpless, but help, helpless, they also, they describe the deficits. They describe what students cannot do. So these are deficit descriptors, even though they can be okay or good for assessment purposes, they're not very good for learning. Okay, let me give you the next example. Next example, um, it shows, this is, you know, the ability to describe. 
and I'm using my children as example. So first at the beginning, this is my boy, I'm one year old, can name and describe objects using one or two words, car, tree, jumping house. Emerging using simple adjectives and short phrases to describe attribute, action, or phenomena. Bad bird, bird chirping, uh, baby crying. It's totally not grammatical, but for me as a mom of two year old, yep, that's a language development that I'm seeing over there. Um, next, developing using simple and complete sentences. So now we're moving from phrases to sentences, describe attribute, action, describe describe multiple objects, actions, and phenomena. I have one example here. My friend Dasha has an LL doll. It can suck, cry, and pee from her belly button. Like, what annoying toy? Why would they ever invent a toy like that? But in any case, this description triggers an emotional reaction, meaning it's successful in terms of function as a description of this, this doll, right? So that's definitely showing the uh, language development there. The proficient level, describe objects, actions, phenomena using complex sentence structure and use uh, language rhetoric techniques such as metaphor analogy and so on. Here I have an example. Mommy, that man without a shirt on, it's strange, as strange as fish sleeping in the water with eyes open. When I hear this, I'm like, wow, that's complex for five-year-old. Uh, this is probably even more complex than what I'm able to produce now, uh, although I, I, you know, I grammatically make it more uh, or, or, or sound, but, you know, it's a, this is a five-year-old <laughs> description and so on. As a parent or as a teacher, looking at this rubric, maybe a three-year-old wouldn't be able to read and understand this rubric, but as a teacher, I see this rubric, I say, okay, maybe that's where I can move my kids or my students towards, right? Uh, after they know to, to name things with one word, I can teach them these attributes or action words so they can move on. I can teach them how to do sentences and, and so on and so forth. So it provides a, a direction for me to move on to help my kids or students to learn to the next level. So these descriptors represent the learning development or progress. And those are kind of the descriptors that I think are uh, useful and helpful for assisting learning. So, we already see the example of the rubric that help with student uh, learning, but the question is how? how what, what approaches that can we take, right? So here I am presenting a three-prong approaches. They are aligning with your course SLOs, analyzing students' performance, actual performance, and investigating learning experiences. These three approaches is best to be used in combination with each other, and they're best done when it's informed of its theory and the research. But even if you are not familiar with theory and research, you can still do this. Um, and it would, you know, you would have a product in the end that is very useful and, and uh, to assist student learning. So let me start with the first approach, which is to align with your course SLOs. In my last session, when I talk about developing student learning outcomes, I talk about the different levels of outcomes. So for example, in this outcome, I have a course level outcome students can interview, meaning students can interact with target language speakers in a competent way. And I also talked about in last session that it is not sufficient for you just leave your course outcomes as is. You really have to think about what is the component skills that the students need to master for them to perform that complex task. What are the building blocks? And develop your task level SLOs so that students can master each, then integrate them to perform that complex uh, skill that you're looking for in your course level SLO. So for me, my task level SLO are politely open and end or exit interview, ask interview questions and, clar and clarification questions, be able to use verbal and nonverbal techniques to engage interviewees, which is what I uh, just mentioned. Okay, so here I have a three learning outcomes. And because these three learning outcomes represent what I think are most important for students to learn and master before they can perform this complex task, they, I put them as a guidance uh, for my students to follow. I break down the verbal in terms of the third and the fourth criteria. I break down the verbal and non-verbal because I think they deserve to be treated separately. 
I ask you to think for five seconds, thinking about conducting interview with target language speakers in a language that you do not know. I give you five seconds to think now. Don't look at these rubrics. Think about that task, interviewing other people using a language totally new to you for five seconds. Okay, five seconds up. Now open your eyes, take a look at these criteria. All right, another five seconds. Sorry, I gave you the time, it's too short. But immediately, you know, when I was thinking about interviewing someone, say in Esperanto, which my husband asked me, uh, uh, promised to learn uh, when he has a full-time job. Now he's a professional for many years, but I only know how to count uh, from one to 10 in Esperanto. I, I think about interviewing someone in Esperanto, I, I, I panicked because I couldn't do that. But when I look at these, these descriptions, I say, Oh, open access interview. It gave me a sense of maybe I can know some sentence patterns. Maybe, you know, I can look up the books. Look at the criteria. It guides me in my thinking of how to go about my learning, what I should be learning. So this uh, rubric function, uh, it function as assisting learning in terms of the gave learners guidance of where to learn, what resources to look for, and how to monitor their progress. So um, this is a good criteria so far. Now let's take a look at the different descriptions. And I'm, because of the time, I'm only going, going to give you one example in terms of open and exit interview at the beginning level. So I will describe it as open interviews with simple greetings, brief thanking, introduction one's name, and the interview task. Exit interview with brief thanking and leave taking. For example, good morning. Thank you for interviewing with me. My name is Yao, and I'd like to ask you a few questions about your daily routine. Uh, exiting interview, I ask all the questions. Thank you, bye. Well, bye may be a little abrupt, but you know this is a beginning level. Even though it's very simple, it still represents a socially appropriate way to go about it, right? Now, at the professional level, at the highest level, this is something that I would write on my performance descriptor. Open interviews with greetings and small talk. Thanking the interviewee uh, through recognition of his or her time or contribution. Introduce oneself, the purpose and the significance of the task. Exit interview with recognition of the interviewee's time and the contribution. Again, inform the interviewee the, the plans to analyze and reporting the interview data, performs leave taking and a good wish for the interview, right? So for example, in this one, I only provide example for the opening. Good morning, Stephen. How are you doing today? I thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview with me. My name is Yao. I'm an undergraduate student studying Chinese. I'm conducting this interview trying to understand how do you carry out your day-to-day -day routine. I will summarize our conversation and share with my classmates. Together, we will make a short documentary on YouTube introducing Chinese community living in Hawaii. So this is the, the opening. Right? So this represents a much higher level of language proficiency and much more polite. Okay, so I talk about aligning with um, your rubric criteria with your uh, SLOs and what you consider as the language developmental stage. Next, here I talk about the second approach, which is observe and analyze student work. So you can go through actual student work and the reasons whether you like them or you're concerned about them. Categorize these reasons and they become your criteria. Uh, I want to introduce a scholar, Su Jiang Yang. She used a performance data-driven rating rubric approach where she used conversation analysis or discourse analysis, carefully analyzing what students produce orally. And this is a rubric that she developed, which I can send you the, the link to her dissertation later. I'll give you one example in terms of a language use. Here, level three, pragmatically, appropriate linguistic expression by causal conditional past progressive tense. I was thinking, I don't think I can model verbs, could, would, might. Level two, which is one level lower, able to use model verbs in monoclausal um, sentences, could, can, might, but does not use various grammatical structure. So as a teacher, you can see how you can help students to move to the next level. So this is a good for learning. Okay, I'm going to skip the next example. 
In terms of observation, how do you carry out or conduct observation? There's three, uh, two approaches, right? One is that you can observe what students can do in the beginning, middle, end of the course. And if a lot of learning happening in the later part of the course, you can then you squeeze in uh, what your observation happens at the third quarter of the course. You can also group students into different uh, proficiency levels or developmental levels and describe whether uh, you know, what the, the, the students in the emerging proficiency can do, approaching proficiency can do, and the proficient group of students can do, and use that to develop your rubric criteria and descriptors. The third is to investigate student learning experience. You can ask your students, what have you learned related to SLO2, Connect Intergroup? Um, what do you feel as challenges? What should I emphasize when giving feedback on your learning progress? What should I use as a criteria to monitor your learning progress? Uh, you can have students to do a group discussion answering these questions. You'll be amazed that students really know a lot about what they are learning and what they should learn more. So to summarize, three approaches, SLOs, actual performance, investigating learning experiences. In terms of the best practices, I would say give students that annotated paper using the rubric language. Okay, here you use the word and however, uh, meanwhile, these words signal, signal the well use of the transition, right? Just annotate on the paper. And here is your examples on your rubric. You can provide a commentary of videos or audio recordings using the rubric language. So for example, my, my, my kid, my daughter wants an LL doll and she was saying, Mommy, I have been thinking that Alexander, which is my boy, would love to have LL doll for his birthday, and so on and so forth. And I would comment in, oh, Freyowin, thank you for asking for it in a such gentle way. You use the word I've been thinking, and it would be nice. So I comment on her language development. Um, so another is that once you have these examples, put these examples on your rubric, and then these serves as a learning material, then you can ask the peers and the students themselves to comment uh, their peers' performance and their self-performance. When you provide feedback, it is best to provide feedback on one criterion at a time. Say, then in the next 20 minutes, we're only going to talk about how do you use nonverbal uh, techniques in terms of engaging or interviewing. Okay? So once you develop rubric for assisting, assisting learning, um, your rubric maybe is the best for assessing learning. And there are two ways, I'm presenting two ways for you to represent your assessment results so that it can inform teaching. First, summative assessment. So after you're great students and you will have a score for your students and every score, average score for each of the criteria. If you really want your students to achieve a score three, which area should you focus on most? That would be the nonverbal techniques because you only got 2.5, right? You also want to look at uh, the criteria asking questions and clarification because this is the best achieved outcome. You may want to think about what have you done that's been successful. So you can use the strategies to teach students in terms of the criteria that's been nice achieved. In terms of formative assessment, now look at the headers, column headers has changed. You can ask your students to keep track of their performance themselves and monitor their progress uh, across the semester. You can average students' performance in each of the quarter so you can see what is the learning progress across the semester. You can see that asking questions, clarifications, is where it takes a gradual and a longer time to learn, uh, but when students learn, they learn very well. Use of nonverbal techniques takes a very uh, quick time to learn. Like this is just hypothetical, right? So you can see how, how the learning is progressing and which areas learn faster and slower and adjust your teaching accordingly. So that's it. So when you develop rubrics, if you develop a rubrics for assisting learning, it would be likely to be a very good rubric for assessing learning. And here is my contact information and I can uh, answer questions if we still have.